Welcome, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. We have a lot that we're going to pack into the next hour, so we don't want to delay. Uh, we'll give a brief introduction here as everyone joins, and then we'll jump right into our topic for today. So first, we just want to let you all know that closed captioning is available. At the bottom of your screen, there should be a closed caption button. Click there and choose show subtitle for closed captioning. Welcome everyone to the University of Phoenix Educational Equity Webinar Series. Today's topic is the 1619 Project, understanding its importance on your journey as an inclusive leader. We're looking forward to hearing from our exceptional speakers as we begin to take this journey into history. This series was created with the hope to foster a learning environment where we can explore paths to empower individual action toward greater unity and impact change. As a higher education institution with more than 56% underrepresented students employed, employed across different industries. It's our hope to facilitate thought provoking conversations to prepare and encourage the practice of inclusive leadership in a culturally complex society. If we can move to the next slide, please. And again to the next slide, thank you. We do want to remind everyone that the Educational Equity Webinar Series is held the third Thursday of each month, and today's session will serve as the first in our focus on the 1619 Project. We want to make sure that you all also register for our next session in the series, which will take place on March 18th. On this date, we're going to welcome Dr. Arlene Kennedy, who is a local superintendent who is able to get the 1619 Project approved to be added to her district's curriculum. Dr. Kennedy brings with her a wealth of historical knowledge, and she has a truly engaging spirit, so you do not want to miss it. She's going to take you through a journey of history that's aligned with education, so we do hope to see you there. We've shared the QR code here, and we'll also be sharing a registration link in the chat. I'll go ahead and hand it over to my colleague, Saray Lopez, now. Thank you. Thank you, and welcome, everyone. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. We highly encourage all of you to connect in the chat, connect with one another, share your LinkedIn profile, where you're joining us from, and any helpful resources you come across related to today's topic. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box in your control panel at the bottom of your screen. We do have a very packed agenda today and may not get through these questions, but we will, our speakers are phenomenal and they've made themselves available to respond to these and we'll share those responses with our recording after the webinar. Please note that you also have the option in the Q&A to maybe vote up if there's a question that really resonates with you as well. All right, joining us today, we have Dr. Sean C. Todd Boone, Associate Dean for Access, and that stands for Advancing Community, Critical Thought, Engagement, Scholarship, and Success. He's also part of the research and residency in our College of Doctoral Studies here at University of Phoenix. We have Fareed Mostufi, and I probably slaughtered your last name and I deeply apologize. Associate Director of Education and Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Lead at the Pulitzer Center. And last but not least, Dr. Salika Etienne, middle school educator and University of Phoenix alumni. Without further ado, we'll turn over the time to Dr. Boone to kick us off. Hold on, hold on, keep your hands the plow hold on hold on hold on keep your hands on the plow hold on when I get to heaven, gonna sing and shout. Be nobody there to put me out. Keep your hands 
things on the plow. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Keep your hands on the plow. Hold on. So there are two categories of early Black American slave songs that were called work songs and spirituals, uh, which are historically called the Negro spiritual. The song I just sang is representative of a work song. The key characteristic of the, of the, uh, the Negro spirituals are passionate, low, sad, and slow, with simple melodies repeated throughout the song. These songs are filled with emotion and detail the strife encountered by the African slave, and yet tell of the hope of freedom, either in this world or the next. The creation of the Negro spiritual was in response to the adjustment of African slaves in a new land and under new confinements, colonial and American slavery. Spirituals were sung as a means of storytelling, to tell of experiences where African slaves felt despised and separate. Whether the song is about resistance, as in the spiritual no more auction block for me, or codes to communicate escapes, as in wade in the water, the African slave told stories that seized the beliefs of Christianity, in, in part because of the hope of redemption from slavery to freedom. The Negro spiritual was a form of resistance, and its social implications are tied to the abolition of slavery and the history of, Amer of America. Spirituals have provided the groundwork for newer genres of music, in particular gospel, and more broadly folk music, jazz, and even hip hop. In this melody, two of my favorite songs, Trouble of the World and Motherless Child, that I've been singing since I was a child, tell different stories. See if you can pick up on the concepts. Soon it will be done. Trouble of the world. Trouble of the world. Trouble of this world. Soon. Welcoming our panelists for today's discussion. 
It gives me a great pleasure to be sharing uh, today's discussion and, and panel with these extraordinary uh, leaders in, in the field of education um, and, and broad, broadly. Uh, Dr. Zalika, uh, Zalika Etienne is an alumna of the College of Doctoral Studies here at the University of Phoenix and a middle school leader and educator. I had a pleasure of sitting as a dissertation committee member on her um, powerful defense uh, and her research uh, titled Stakeholder Perceptions Regarding the Influence of Hip Hop Pedagogy on Student Learning, a Case Study. And Mr. Fareed Mustofi, Associate Director of Education and DEI Lead Pulitzer Center. I'd like to start with, uh, with you, Fareed, if I may. Um, so the Pulitzer Center has been a significant collaborator in creating and disseminating the 1619 curriculum artifacts to schools. What is 1619 and some of those resources? Thank you so much. I'm still processing the beautiful art that was just shared and music. Thank you so much for that. Um, so thank you again. I'm Fareed Mostofi uh, from the Pulitzer Center. And I wanna tell you a little bit about us and then yes, how we're uh, connected to this incredible project. And part of my goal today is you leave knowing all the elements of the project, seeing where your interests might lie, what interests might connect to the work that you do in the communities that you connect with and how you might um, then pursue uh, starting to look at the project yourselves. So uh, why don't we start? I've got some slides here. I'm a visual learner myself, so <laughs> pulled some things together today. Um, to start with, uh, this is the, the uh, website for the organization I work with, the Pulitzer Center, where our mission is to raise awareness of underreported global issues, um, including those in our own backyard through direct support for quality journalism. That's direct grants to staff and freelance journalists to cover these stories that often don't get told due to funding, uh, lack of funding. And then we also have a unique program of education and outreach. We focus around the idea of underreported stories, definitely something at the center of the 1619 Project. Stories that just aren't getting the attention they should, often they're tied to systemic issues. They're um, in, connected to people whose voice are, are not heard for so many different reasons. Um, so if you want to see some of those, you might have seen some already on uh, some of the news outlets we've worked with. Here are some of the places where um, journalists have published their, uh, their work after receiving grants from the Pulitzer Center. Um, and they're reporting on all kinds of different issues, ranging from climate change, migration, um, issues affecting governments, uh, affecting people of all backgrounds, racial justice, uh, issues around uh, land rights and um, property rights. So feel free to follow us at Pulitzer Center or check out our website if you're interested in any of those issues from anywhere in the world. Also educators out there, we work to uh, collaborate with educators to connect these issues through not only making all articles we support and resources we support available for free on our sites, so you don't need to have um, a subscription to any of those outlets. We have lesson plans, we can connect journalists to your classrooms for presentations, and we lead workshops. Um, and also, uh, speaking of uh, the 1619 project, this is part of what uh, we want to do around this project connecting to all those different programs. So we started connecting with the 1619 Project by writing some reading guides to connect to the uh, release of the New York Times Magazine. Uh, but we also are continuing to do outreach around this project, including events like today. Um, and uh, what I hope I can share a little more about later, but wanted to briefly mention now, is we're also embarking on a, the creation of a network to bring education professionals together to create and share curriculum that evaluate how elements of this important project connect to our curricula and the needs of our communities um, through creating original units, sharing them in our schools and districts. And then this network will collaborate to share knowledge and hopefully post all of that to um, our, a free platform that we're developing that will be out next fall. So um, the link is out there uh, and I'll put it in the chat when I finish this uh, short presentation. Um, but educators, please connect if you're interested in the network but what is this project? Um, so this is the opening image from the 1619 project and it outlines the project pretty well. It reads, in August of 1619, a ship appeared on this horizon near Port Comfort, a coastal port in the English colony of Virginia. It carried more than 20 enslaved Africans who were sold to the colonists. 
No aspect of the country that would be formed here has been untouched by the years of slavery that followed. On the 400th anniversary of this fateful moment, it is finally time to tell our story truthfully. And the project is really looking at our story, the story of America. So to hear a little bit more about it, here is the project's creator, um, kind of curator, and also one of the contributors to the project's essays, Nicole Hannah-Jones. Today, the New York Times published the print edition of the 1619 Project. The name marks this month's 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first enslaved people brought from Africa to the then Virginia colony. The Times says the project aims to reframe the country's history, understanding 1619 is our true founding, and placing the consequences of slavery and the contributions of black Americans at the very center of the story we tell ourselves about who we are. The project is led by New York Times Magazine reporter Nicole Hannah-Jones, who is the author of the opening essay. She joins me now. You have been working on this for a number of years, but you put this together very quickly. First of all, why? Why this topic? Why this issue? Well, you don't have uh, very many opportunities to ever celebrate the 400th anniversary of anything. Mm. And it seemed to me that this was a great opportunity to really, as you said in your opening, reframe the way that we have thought about an institution that has impacted um, almost everything in modern American society, but that we're taught very little about, that we're often taught is marginal to the American story. And we wanted to do something different. We wanted to use the platform of the times to force us to confront the reality of what slavery has meant for our development as a nation. And this isn't just about sort of the, the kind of textbook ideas of what happened to slaves. You're, you've got essays in here about health care, about geography, about sugar, about music, all of these different ripple effects that happen throughout the economy um, and, and really life here. You say uh, in a sentence, you said, you know, we would not be the United States were it not for slavery. This is kind of one of the original fibers that made this country. Absolutely. The conceit of the magazine is that one of the things we hear all the time is, well, that was in the past. Why do you have to keep talking about the past? Well, one, I think the past is clearly instructive for, the, for how, uh, how we are right now. Mm -hmm. But also, the conceit of the magazine is that you can look at all of these modern phenomena that you think are unrelated to slavery at all, and we were going to show you how they are. And so we have a story in there about traffic patterns. We have a story about why we're the only Western industrial country without universal health care, about why Americans consume so much sugar, about capitalism, about democracy. We're really trying to change the way that Americans are thinking that this was just uh, a problem of the past that we've resolved and show that it isn't. Um, you'll be receiving these slides and you're welcome to continue to hear this really fascinating discussion, but hopefully we have a sense of the key themes here in questions. What is the lasting impact of slavery and the policies, culture, um, life that, that uh, grew out of that system? Um, what, how does that look today? And also, what do we learn about uh, the United States as it is now and the ways that it has grown to uphold the values outlined in the Declaration of Independence by centering the story of Black Americans? And how does that happen? Clearly, one person cannot <laughs> address this question alone. Um, the project includes uh, contributions by over 30 different people, 18 essays by leading journalists and historians, 15 poems and short stories that look at underrepresented moments in U.S. history and bring those the feelings and experiences of, of those moments to life through creative writing. There are two photo essays, um, a print broadsheet, which uh, is uh, includes a photo series curated by uh, the Smithsonian Museum of African American History and Culture, um, two essays that evaluate how slavery is taught in schools today. There's also a five episode podcast and a kids section. So briefly, this is what that looks like. Let me leave this slide um, up for just uh, 15 seconds of quiet and just take a look at some of the themes here and notice for yourself, what are some of the themes that are connecting to you and the people that are in your community? Each of these essays is, um, not only the text, but also primary source documents and original art embedded throughout. Also all are anchored by a key compelling question or provocative quote that, that draw the reader in 
to a, a historical analysis uh, through the lens of, in this case at the top left, Janine Interlandi writes about our healthcare system and why is that, how is that connected to systems that were established to uphold slavery? On the top right, we hear, we look at mass incarceration with Brian Stevenson. What does a traffic jam in Atlanta have to do with segregation? Kevin Cruz explores that. So um, in a moment, I'll go ahead and drop a PDF version of the project into the chat that you're welcome to, uh, that's available for free. And please feel free to explore audio learners out there. Four of those essays were also explored uh, through podcast episodes. Um, I wanna mention for educators out there, there are a lot of primary source documents and original photography to engage people of all ages and also people who are just more visual like I am. There's also the creative works, um, each of which not only has the, the writing them itself, but also um, the moment in history that that piece of writing is connected to. The broadsheet looks kind of like this. You can see um, uh, one thing that's really interesting is there's a curator um, commentary on each of the objects that are, uh, that are included. Um, and also for younger teachers of younger audiences out there, there's a really short sheet that's also available to you. So that's the project itself. It's a lot of content. So I'm gonna unshare for now and uh, drop it into the chat so you can explore. Thank you so much, Farid, for that background and context. I know you have a full, uh, a full agenda, a day-to-day. -day. You will be, I know, later in a of a meeting and a webinar with Nicole Hannah-Jones um, with for the American Federation of Teachers with uh, Randy Weingarten. Uh, and I also know that you and I share uh, a little a little history. I was Teach for America uh, uh, Corps 2002, Los, uh, Los Angeles, and I believe you were Teach for America in DC. Um, and so um, I'm, I, I'm hoping to drop in today, uh, this evening as well, to hear um, some of that uh, discussion. Um, so, Pri, you, you, you mentioned so many of the critical themes coming out of the essays, and as a career institution, uh, that is the University of Phoenix, and particularly in, in my College of Doctoral Studies, seeing so many opportunities for rich depth, uh, breadth of research um, that can be done on the various topics even there. Um, today, we're focused also on music and the influence of slavery on American music. What are some of the critical elements from Wesley Morris's essay, For Centuries, Black Music Forged in Bondage Has Been the Sound of Complete Artistic Freedom? No wonder everybody is always stealing it. Mm. Um, well, let's take a look at some elements of the essay here. When I have uh, explored this with educators and students, we often start with this guiding question, which is, what is American music? And I invite everyone in the call today to just imagine in, in their ears and their minds and their brains, what images do you see? What sounds do you hear when you think of American music? Feel free to share that in the chat. Um, but what I'll uh, do now is share some of the images and documents embedded within uh, Morris's essay to see how these might align or be different from some of what came to your mind when you thought of American music? Like all of the essays in the project, um, this essay begins with a statement uh, to draw in the, in the reader and introduce us to the uh, the concept that will be explored. This reads, for centuries, black music forged in bondage has been the sound of complete artistic freedom. No wonder everybody is always stealing it. Morris's essay is accompanied with a, whoa, okay, a podcast episode with, that you see when you get the slides, you can jump right to it. Um, but I thought I would share with you a quote from the essay and then a quote from the podcast that captures some of the key um, claims that are made, of course, and then supported with, re with really interesting research and analysis. In the essay, Morris writes, when we're talking about black music, we're talking about horns, drums, keyboards, and guitars doing the unthinkable together. We're also talking about what the borrowers and collaborators don't want to or can't lift, centuries of weight, of atrocity we've never sufficiently worked through. The blackness you know is beyond theft because it's too real, too rich, too heavy to steal. 
the podcast concludes uh, after looking at an analysis of some comparisons to where we see um, connections between music um, created by Black Americans and uh, other uh, music that has the, and the influences of that music. Uh, Morse concludes by saying, what you're hearing in Black music that's so appealing to so many people of, of all races across time is possibility, struggle, it is strife, it is humor, it is sex, it is confidence. And that's ironic because this is the sound of a people who for decades and centuries have been denied freedom. And yet what you respond to in black music is the ultimate expression of a belief in that freedom, the belief that the struggle is worth it, that the pain begets joy and that that joy you're experiencing is not only contagious, it's necessary and urgent and irresistible. Black music is American music because as Americans, we say we believe in freedom and that's what we tell the world. And the power, power of black music is that it's the ultimate expression of that belief in American freedom. So hopefully that provides a little bit of context, um, but I'm, I'm excited that we have some scholars on the call who can uh, walk with us through how to dive into that even more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fareed. Uh, the Pulitzer Center. Dr. Zalika Etienne, um, I want to get your take here. Uh, and, you know, I, I always talk about meeting you the first time I met you in the extraordinary um, at uh, your doctoral residency. And as part of your culminating project, you, um, you did spoken word rap, uh, and it was phenomenal and had everyone uh, roaring. And so I would love for you to talk a little bit about, um, you know, we started today with selections of, uh, at the roots of, of, of Black American music. Can you tell us more about other American music genres, how they were influenced um, because of Black music and some of the takeaways from your research findings on hip hop pedagogy? Yes, so thank you again for having me here today to be a part of this very important conversation. And I appreciate being able to give credit where credit is due, specifically highlighting the global influence of Black music. So this is a particularly timely conversation to be having, not just because it's February and typically we pay homage to Black-related experiences during Black History Month, but I don't know if we're aware of this, but on January 18th, 2021, the National Museum of African American music officially opened in Nashville, Tennessee. And so it through its seven galleries, it ties back to what we've been discussing on this webinar. It points to different aspects of the African American experience manifested through black music, right? And so in their opening, they referenced that the museum was 20 years in the making, but really they highlighted the fact that it was really 400 years in the making, right? Pointing to the fact that black music has roots that have been evolving since slavery, right? And if we're gonna say slavery, we have to even without question, go back to Africa, go back to even earlier than that, right? And so when we talk about black music and, um, and we're understanding, we're, we're understanding that it represents as has already been stated, but I just wanna kind of highlight and, and elevate this idea. We're talking about black communication and black vocabulary and, and black energy and black suffering and black struggle and Black prayer and Black joy and Black pain, right? And Black activism, Black respect, Black hope, Black love, and, and, and so much more, right? All towards the journey of what? Black justice. Black equity. Black equality. Still all in the making, right? We're still moving towards this direction. So when we talk about the influence of Black music on other genres, it's with this understanding that you're bound to hear war chants and, and shouts and, and spirituality and, and call and response, right? And, and hollers and ballads and, and children's songs and lullabies and minstrel tunes and the chain gang work songs. I've been working on the railroad, right? All of that and the scatting and all of that, right? The blues melodies the poetry, and so much more. You're, you're going to hear all of that, and it shouldn't be a surprise when you hear it wrapped in some of your favorite music genres, your gospel, 
as we have already alluded to, ragtime, folk music, rhythm and blues, country, reggae, pop, rock, and hip hop. <laughs> and so Black music um, played, I, I read this quote and I, I definitely think it's worth highlighting that Black music played and is still playing an undeniable role in the soundtrack of America, right? Because our music is still, you know, um, manifesting. So while it is significant to note that Black music has inspired 50 different genres and subgenres of music, we must also acknowledge that its reach is far greater than that, right? Like its, its reach influences culture and trends. Think about fashion and sports and dance and humanity and yes, education, <laughs> right? And personally, I have been inspired by black music, more specifically hip hop music as an educator for 23 years now and a parent I have had a, a, you could say a front row seat to hip hop music and its influence on every single aspect of youth culture. And those engaged with youth, it would behoove them to just have your ear to what's happening in, in the hip hop world and, and who's hot. <laughs> right? Because this is what our children, the children that some of us on the call are teaching are listening to, are very knowledgeable about, right? And so I'm, I'm not sure if you all are aware of this, but Nielsen is the music industry data um, an analysis, analysis. And they reported in 2017 that R&B and hip hop became the most dominant genre of music in the U.S. for the first time ever. And so this is phenomenal that, you, you know, it's, it's highlighted in the data analysis, right? And so, and then one year later, Kendrick Lamar, who may be familiar to you all, won the Pulitzer. Oh, imagine we're talking about Pulitzer Center, right? The Pulitzer in music becoming um, the first rapper to do so. And again, this is significant because this award is usually given to the classical field or someone in the jazz area. So again, this nod or this point to the significance and the power of hip hop. So as I approached my own research, I, I did so with a desire to explain perceptions on the influence of hip hop pedagogy on student learning. Right. And so when we talk about hip hop pedagogy, for some of us who may not be familiar with that term, it's term, it's it's to be understood as a thorough and thoughtful incorporation of hip hop music and lyrics and culture, hip hop history, right? The knowledge of self, understanding graffiti art and all of these different aspects of the elements of hip hop in a manner that increases educational outcomes for students. And so as I embarked upon my research, I sought out three groups of people. I sought out education leaders. I sought out educators themselves. And I, I sought out a group that I called high school alumni who were out of high school and had some kind of experience dealing with hip hop pedagogy. They were either taught or, and, and ironically, a lot of them were maybe fresh out of college and just teaching and, and would implore some of these same strategies that um, they had been experienced, you know, in their, in their own work. And I had the awesome opportunity to interview um, heavy influences in like the hip hop field, like um, Dr. Shango Blake. And, and he actually was um, somebody that I got an opportunity to interview and hear about his very innovative movement in terms of transforming his Queens middle school. And so through a whole school reform. So, you know, I, I, when I, in my research, I'm realizing that it could take a whole school reform approach. It could even take an individual classroom approach with teachers utilizing their experience and integrating hip hop into ELA, into math into sciences, right? And, and, and all across the academic spectrum. And so 
And then teachers giving me victory reports of how they were able to do such phenomenal things. But let me just say that I, my research concluded with four major ways that hip hop pedagogy influence student learning. And so like when I'm tying this before I get into that, while I'm tying all of this together, together I'm looking at the power of music and, and realizing that it would behoove us to activate its power in our classrooms. So specifically, or, or whatever educational or organizational arena platform we find ourselves navigating. And so what I found was that for the four major areas was that hip hop pedagogy in, had a positive influence on student identity and improved student behavioral outcomes. Right, like there's something about being able to speak a, a student's language, being able to connect with them on just where they are, and and just the excitement and the energy. Um, I didn't respond in the chat, but I was just reading some of the responses when Dr. Boone was singing. Look at how some of you were saying it gave you goosebumps, right? And just all of these things were able to resonate with you, you know, personally. So we, we found that it influences student identity and improves student behavioral outcomes. Also found that you know, it, it influenced student connection with the academic content, right? Students are gonna listen a little bit differently when, you know, they're like, oh, you, you know that? Okay, you, you, you understand where I'm coming from, my culture, my community. Maybe I'm gonna listen to you a little bit more closely because mm, you're not so high off that um, maybe I can't learn something from you. So I, I, I thought that that was very exciting to hear. And also this influence on project-based learning experiences. I was able to interview a, a few of my um, professor, well, not professors, um, leaders. And one school in particular, it was just a phenomenal Juneteenth celebration. Um, George Patterson was the, the educational leader in that building and just the project-based learning around social justice and, and hip hop and just some of the other dynamic moves that he was making in his building was a benefit for students. You know, he, he read the room in the sense of he, he knew what his community needed and he was pushing to, do what students needed to do to to get the most out of education, right? And so, so, so there was that, and then this influence on social emotional learning, right? I, I also found that it had an influence there. And so, anybody who is working with students knows that it's not just about reading and writing. Although I'm an ELA teacher and have been for I would say the last what ten of maybe 10 or so years of the 23. So I know the importance of ELA, but a student is not gonna comprehend anything if we cannot connect with them social and emotionally, right? There's this, this part of students that need to feel comfortable and feel loved and music, you know, we, we may look at it as something so small and trivial, but it can, it can help towards this. So those were some of my findings. I, I loved, I love hip hop. I love the research. I could go on and on about it. The phenomenal leaders and teachers and, and um, high school alumni that I was able to interview and hear um, so much about, but yeah, some phenomenal work um, that people are out here doing. And so it's exciting to you know, um, be connected with this, this other resource. And, and I hope that those of us who are connecting with students and really don't know what to do, that maybe you start with maybe the 1619 project and just, and some of the resources that they have for teachers and maybe just start digging through there and seeing what we can, you know, get away with. And, and I'm saying get away with because some of the institutions we're in are very structured about the curriculum that we must teach. And so we have to be creative to, to connect with our children. All right, I know that was kind of long, Dr. Boone, but I, I hope that I have covered, <laughs> answered your Thank question. Thank you so much, Dr. Etienne. 
<laughs> and the passion and uh, and you know I, I mean it's how wonderful it is to be in your classroom and to be getting this experience and and as you said speaking the language and something that I think is so important that you that you also said and, and that Fareed said is that that sort of this this context right this sort of language that is developed through the through the music um, and so thank you so much um, we've got a little time left and so I want to sort of just uh, switch gears to implications for leaders um, at, a, at, a, at a more broader sense for, for folks who are on the phone as a takeaway. So this month is also Black History Month. Uh, and Black History Month was instituted 45 years ago in, in 1976. Um, at that time, President Ford asked the country to, and I quote, seize the opportunity to honor the too often neglected accomplishments of Black Americans in every area of endeavor throughout our history. And I think how powerful that is for uh, the, the sort of head of, of our political system in the sense to say this to Americans as a charge. Um, change has occurred throughout the country uh, in the past 45 years, um, but oftentimes change has been slow. Transformation remains vital to achieving our optimal diversity level throughout our corporate, institutional, and political leadership. The US Census predicts that by 2044, most of our nation's population will be people of color and diversity should continue to grow accordingly. While I consider diversity to be an equitable mix of social and racial categories, I would define inclusion as the creation of a culture and environment in which all individuals are treated equally. Inclusion can therefore be considered the means to achieve the goal of diversity. Diversity in the workplace is crucial and critical as it represents successful and effective inclusion. And it says that we value all people. So I'd like to start with you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Etienne. We, um, how can educational leaders leverage black music and hip hop history to be more inclusive within their academic institutions? Yeah, so this is this is an important question, and I just want to preface it by saying there's no patent answer here. And so my first recommendation, well, before I go to my recommendation, I just want to say every school, every organization, every institution, every person is different. And I think that we need to start with a desire to want to be inclusive and a desire to want to plan outside of the box and think outside of the box because for those of us still in classrooms, it is gonna take extra planning, right? And, and then depending on what our leader is like, <laughs> you know, it may require us getting certain permissions to do certain extra things. So, so I just wanna preface it there and just say that, but think about what you're willing to do. And, and specifically for leaders, I mentioned this in regards to my research, what I found was that the schools where the leaders were understanding of culture and understanding of the, the community that they service and willing to go against some of the Eurocentric curriculum related norms, those were the, the, the buildings that and the students that I would say benefited most from this black music and, and realizing and hip hop and realizing, seeing themselves in the curriculum, right? And so whatever situation we find ourselves in, you know, because again, I don't know all of who's on, on the call, but I would say if, if it's a leader that is interested, right? Like look for, opportunities to infuse it, you know, at least preliminarily, like obviously we really need a whole transition, a whole shift, a whole let's get rid of and re redo, not reimagine, but redo. However, <laughs> you know, just moving in the direction that we are moving into, let's start with where can I do project base and, and maybe infuse there? Where can I, I do, I'm teaching about something historic. Where can I infuse, like even if I'm teaching in history about the Jim Crow South, where can I infuse some of the music that was 
eminent during their civil rights movement, some of the songs, you know, like I had the pleasure of, of teaching my students Stamped by Jason Reynolds and Ibram X. Kendi. And, and I really liked how we took some time to step back from the curriculum and feed students with some of the music of the era. We talked about, you know, um, James Brown would say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. And I'm and I teach in a, a predominantly Latin ex community. And one of the young ladies, a big takeaway from her was like, she didn't realize that when James Brown wrote that song, it was so black people could feel good about themselves, right? And so just being, I, I felt good about being able to, to, to do that. And so we just have to, whatever commitments we make, we need to then do it, right? And so maybe it's a virtual after school class. Maybe it's virtual field trips because let's we all in a pandemic together and right here we all and, and education as usual has changed, but it's looking to see what we can do. And then even opportunities like this guest speaker series where we know what resources we have. I think it's great that, you know, your next speaker series, you have a, a superintendent that's going to talk about how this curriculum is now going to be a part of the district. Right. And so it'd be great to hear some of those manifestations in that work. And then hopefully it'll be contagious and spread, you know, but, but again, let's decide this is what we want to do. Think about how it can impact our organization. Think about our culture. And then like, once you make the determination, do it. Cause a lot of times we do a lot of talking about what we want to do and then there's no action behind it. So that's, that would be what I would say. Thank you so much, Dr. Etienne. Um, Fareed, I'd like to come to you. What are, what are some of the takeaways from the 1619 essays that corporate leaders can capture within diversity and inclusion discussions? Uh, I'll capture some things I've heard from, from district leaders, uh, educators who I've worked with. One is that it's engaging. So if you are looking for a resource that um, will get your, your, the community you work with excited, you saw the, the way that the statements begin with something provocative that could start a conversation without even reading. Of course we should read, right? To look at the, you know, the, the analysis, but it's engaging. I've been hearing that for, for at least from teachers, uh, young people are more excited about analyzing the historical analysis and the claims and the personal narratives and the creative works in the 1619 project and it's leading it's creating a bridge for them to be more interested in history so that's one thing i would say is it it can it can open a window into some of the conversations you might want to be having having through engaging text audio photos um, that that's one element another thing i'll say i've heard from teachers who talk about how their students have questions about what they're seeing in America. They are, they, the engagement with the 1619 project is actually helping them process and better understand the context for some of what they're seeing in breaking news headlines. Um, so that's the second thing I would offer is that it's a project that uh, will, will maybe help in the processing that, you know, all of these things that we're seeing in our country um, over history, but especially looking at the past year, um, these are, there's, there's a content here that could help open up some of those discussions, knowing that people are coming to these discussions with completely individual experiences and are coming to it very differently. It can be an anchor to start some of the conversations. The third thing um, I'll mention is that, so, um, I, I thought I would reference some of what uh, we've heard from teachers. I love, I, there's a quote from a teacher from North Carolina that I, I pulled up that says, the most patriotic thing a teacher can do is to teach the truth of our country, to teach the complexity of how this young nation came to be and to help each student see how their history is a part of American history. And I think it's interesting. Uh, another thing that will engage, uh, be engaging in the project there is, is content. There's a lot of history and content that for some people you in your communities will feel obvious and something maybe they learned from their parents or grandparents and for others will be totally new. So there's content that's very engaging. Um, there's also a lot of, um, while there's analysis of the challenges, there's a lot of hope and there's a lot of um, 
Um, I love Nicole Hannah Jones often references that this in her essay, her actual bookend is a sort of questioning of why her father, um, who is a veteran, decided to put the American flag outside of their family home and how she felt really conflicted about that as she learned about U.S. history. And in the course of writing this essay, um, the kind of closing uh, discovery is her pride and under and belief in why um, she felt her father had had enormous right uh, to have and and pride and and why he would have that pride and it's through an analysis of history and the ways that contributions by black Americans have led to changes to the Constitution changes to our laws um, and and uh, policies that have impacted all of us so that's something that I think is positive that's powerful too is is the hope and also the aspiration because there are are you saw in the list of essay topics issues that affect all of us and there's a question I'm really thinking about what you said, um, Sean, about Dr. Boone, the idea of, of the power of diversity, of equ equity as a pathway to real inclusion and therefore diversity, that um, it makes life better for everyone. And, and we see through many of these essays how there might have been opportunities for systems that frustrate us to be very different. Um, if we were to uh, look for a more equitable way forward, actually, we would all benefit from that. So um, those are some of the, the key takeaways I found. Uh, if you are interested in, in learning more about the project, I'm going to drop our curriculum into the chat. And also, like uh, Dr. Boone said, we will have uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and um, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Khalil Gibran Muhammad, who wrote the essay focused on sugar, um, which which tracks all the way from um, the introduction of sugar to plantations in the in what became the United States to the present. Um, so if you want to hear from them, that's at five o'clock today. Um, but I bet some of you out there, uh, especially those of you in education networks, might be thinking of ideas that you want to explore. So the last thing I'll just sort of pitch in this moment is if you think you or someone you know would be interested in the education network, it is a grant funded opportunity. So you would, you would have funding for it. Um, I'll drop that in the chat as well. And uh, we encourage you to apply. Thank you so much, Farid. You know, I think um, to the, the, the sort of topics that, uh, the broad topics that the essays cover and, and the narrow focus uh, as well, you know, it got me thinking about that, you know, leaders can take away in, in terms of, it doesn't matter the field, there's something for everyone in these essays to really be able to capture and the question, to answer the question, how are we serving um, communities of color, how are we serving, uh, in, in, in specifically um, uh, Black Americans, African Americans, um, Latino Americans, uh, Asian Americans, how are we serving them um, based on the themes within, the, within these essays? So um, thank you, thank you both so much. Uh, and uh, Dr. Zalika Etienne uh, and uh, Mr. Fareed um, Mustofi. Uh, and thank you to uh, those who joined us today. Uh, thank you for your time. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to turn it back over to um, Saray and Tundra. Uh, we, I think we may have time for some questions, but um, also to, to help close us out. So thank you. Thank you all. Uh, I think I can speak for both Saray and myself, as well as the attendees with the engagement in the chat that this has been quite an impactful session um, as someone who has read the 1619 project and I thought took a deep dive, I took a deep dive into them, but you all presented it so well today. Um, so thank you, Dr. Etienne, for your unique perspective. I hope that everyone saw. Um, Dr. Etienne is also an author and I shared a link to her book in the chat. So please check that out. Um, Fareed, thank you so much for the in-depth uh, overview of the 1619 Project. Um, Fareed also has a event later today and we shared the link to that in the chat. I hope that you all will join that so that you can actually do a deeper dive into the 1619 Project. And Dr. Boone, words cannot describe the chills I felt when you started this session with that song. That was so amazing. I have to admit it was even a bit emotional, so I was glad that I was not on camera. Um, thank you all for all that you've done and all that you squeezed into this short time frame. We don't have much time left. 
Um, but we did get some questions, so we'll see if we can answer one or two. Uh, and then, as Saray mentioned at the top of the hour, for those questions that we don't get to, we will make sure that we follow up and get them answered for you. We thank our panelists for agreeing to follow up after and answer any open questions. So with that being said, we will see what questions we have here. Um, let's see. Uh, the first one we have here is for you, Dr. Etienne. Um, I have two kids and I was wondering at what age do you feel is appropriate and understanding enough to talk to them about the struggles and racism that African-Americans have had to deal with in the past? Yeah, so I, that's a great question. I have a 15-year-old um, son that I birthed and several pre, several nephews before um, him that I raised. And so I honestly think that it's you have to do it with gentleness, but, it's, but they have to understand like some of the obstacles and safety measures that they need to take, you, you know, um, while they're in the world. Um, one of the things, even as a, a, a teacher that I, I stressed is a lot of times, you know, this idea about like deadlines and, and having students high quality work and all that, like if you keep, I understand, um, allowing grace for like assignments, let's just say that. Um, but I also know that the world is not giving us grace, a bunch of grace and the, we have to still meet deadlines. And so like, that's just an example of me trying to prepare eighth graders for like the world ahead of them, right? And the high school world, college world. So I think that, you know, every parent is different. Um, you're, a pro, you're, you know, your child, you know, maybe one child, you can say a certain thing, maybe they're older than the other, but I, I mean, as early as possible to kind of give them the information that they need because you can turn on the news and see the world that we're living in, you know? And yes, we are talking about there is hope, um, but we also want to give them the playbook, right? And so that they're able to navigate this world that we live in, that in 400 years has changed a little, right? But we have so much um, farther to go. I hope that that answers. <laughs> I could say more, but I, I, I won't. Thank you, that was great. Again, this has been a fantastic session. Um, thank you all. Thank you all for participating. I hope that everyone uh, who participated in this uh, webinar will join us for our next session. We provided the reg registration link in the chat that will be on March 18th. Again, we will have Dr. Arlene Kennedy joining us in presenting the 1619 Project and its impact on education. Please join us again for that. Um, this has just been amazing. Um, once again, thank you to all of our panelists. This truly was a journey and you all provided us with a very unique opportunity to examine music and its relevance to all of our history. So before we end, I'd just like to remind us all to successfully impact change within systems that were historically built for a society, not as culturally diverse as what we live in today, it is crucial to have actively engaged and intentional leadership to bring equity and inclusion efforts to fruition and properly embed them into company-wide policies, procedures, strategic goals, and objectives. We hope that as you join us for the Educational Equity Webinar Series, it helps you to enable that process. Thank you all again for joining us and have a great day. Bye-bye.